good morning, everyone. Welcome to our special edition of CPED this morning. Um, we're going to call the meeting to order, and i just like to acknowledge that the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. Do we have quorum, Mr. Clerk? Yes, we do. All right. Uh, I'm going to call for the approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Do we have any additions and deletions and or deletions today? There are no requests for additions, deletions or deferrals from the clerk's office. All righty then. Um, do we do a show of hands for this? Yes, we do because we're in CPAD. Okay, all in favor, please signify by saying yes. Aye. All <laughs> Yep, that's important to do too. Second by <laughs> Vice uh, Chair Cuddle. All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. All right, excellent. Thank you. Um, call for declaration of conflict of interest. No, correspondence, petitions, and delegations. Do we have any correspondence? There's been no correspondence received by the clerk's office. All right, petitions, councillors or clerk. Any petitions? There have been no petitions received by the clerk's office. All right. Now I am very pleased to hand the meeting over to, oh yes, Mr. Clerk, yep. Uh, we just have to begin by suspending the AO1 speaking rules. Absolutely. That is under the deletions, additions and deletions section oh, okay. of your annotated agenda. It is. Oh dear, look at that. So, it is the intention to begin the meeting by suspending A01 speaking rules pursuant to S42 during the approval of the order of business. That's that. Would someone like to move that, please? Thank you, okay. Councillor Blackburn, seconded by. Yep, thank you, Vice Chair Cuddle. All right, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. All opposed? Pardon me? Yes, go ahead, Councillor Smith. Why, why are we doing that? I think because this is a special meeting where we have a prolonged presentation, and so we are um, we are just changing the rules so that we can accommodate the longer presentation. Okay, cool, great, thanks. For our special meeting today. Works for me. All right, Mr. Clerk, are we good to go? We're good to go. Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce our Mayor Savage. Hand over the meeting to you, sir. Well, thank you very much. I, I, this is a bit unusual. The whole meeting is unusual, but I, I very much appreciate your indulgence and the committee's indulgence just to say a couple of words. I always swore before I became mayor that I would never be one of these drive-by mayors who comes in and leaves, but I do it all the time, and it's, uh, that's just how it is. And I'm really sorry to do that because I respect the work of this committee, but I do just want to say a word about uh, the presentation that, uh, that, that I will miss uh, today, and I very seldom want to miss Danny Graham's presentations. Uh, I've had so many of them in my life, uh, but I want to just, uh, <laughs> I'll watch it on YouTube. Uh, our, our guests today are, are, are known to, probably to all of us, and either by reputation or certainly personally, so Sarah Napier is here with us from United Way who do such amazing work. And I love to see United Way working with Engage Nova Scotia. So Sarah, it's delightful to see you. The work we've done together, the partnership uh, the, between the city and United Way on, you know, s certainly on housing for the last number of years, it means a lot to us. And uh, uh, Danny Graham, uh, who at various points in my life has been like a brother to me, uh, which means we argue about everything. Um, and because uh, we both have troublesome brothers uh, to deal with without each other. So I almost feel like declaring a conflict because of these two, but I think the work they do is so important. So I really do appreciate what they do. I think it's important that um, as the city has taken on this, particularly taken on this uh, challenge and accepted the challenge of inclusive growth that is sustainable, uh, how we measure that is really important. The Halifax Partnership have done amazing stuff and really have put metrics around all of the stuff that they've done. Um, but I think that there's a real tie-in uh, here with the work that Engage does. Uh, I know that uh, Sarah has signed, the United Way have signed an MOU with the partnership. That's the kind of thing I hope the partnership will do with Engage um, as well. 
Uh, and I know that there was uh, an agreement a few years ago where we would fund engage $40,000 for each of two years, and on the second year it would be after some kind of reporting. <clears throat> With COVID and everything else, it kind of got lost um, in a technical term between the jigs and the reels, I think. And so I'm delighted that the vice chair will be bringing forward a motion to reinstate that 40,000 uh, funding. But more importantly, that we work uh, together with Engage, I think our staff, the Paul Johnson and now Connor O'Day, I think it is, Danny, who's a, a lead on, on this. Maggie's been certainly, uh, it's nice to have uh, Maggie in the uh, chair because she's very familiar with the work that Engage has done over the last number of years. And I think that as we look to the future of this <clears throat> city, the two people who speak today represent it as well as, as anybody. And so, you know, understanding where we are, um, understanding how people feel, their quality of life, you know, what, what they feel about the work that we're doing is really important. The work that's happening by lots of orders of government, individuals, organizations, just generally people's lives and how can we improve their lives and make their lives better. Quality of life is a priority of this city. And so I think this piece today on it that Engage is going to show us, th there is unbelievable information available that has been collected. And it would be a dereliction of duty if we did not use it. Um, and, uh, and partner to make sure that we do use it. So I just wanted to say that. I, I uh, really appreciate uh, you guys to, to be here. It's not the first time for either of you to, uh, to be in front of uh, council. Certainly, Councillor Hensby can be very intimidating, and uh, you know, I, I, we recognize, but I hope you can handle that. And uh, I, I, I wish the committee well today in their deliberation. I had a chance to talk to Lindell yesterday about this. Uh, Councillor Smith as well, I think, who's also been very supportive of uh, the work. So I think it's an important meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to say a few words. Certainly, Mr. Mayor, any time. So thank you so much for being here again. And um, so just a reminder, you have an hour to present to us your amazing information. We are looking forward to it. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, so we're very happy to have Danny Graham, Chief Engagement Officer of Engage Nova Scotia, and Sarah from United Way, Napier. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair Purdy, uh, Mr. Mayor, and full council, and Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Uh, really good to see you all, and it's good to see you all in person. It's been a while since I've had the chance to sit in, a, in this chair in the middle of council chambers. Um, just a quick couple of words for me to kick off before I turn it over to, to Danny to go through all of the wonderful content that we want to review today. Um, a little bit of a, re a recap, um, as, as mentioned, I am the CEO of United Way Halifax, um, and our role, I think, as the Council is, is very familiar with, is we bridge widening gaps and build capacity for people who are experiencing poverty and marginalization in HRM. And we do this in many different ways. We fundraise and we fund organizations and programs. We partner with community, with government, with business. We convene critical conversations and teams in action. And we also advocate with peers for solutions. And one of those peer groups that we work closely with is Engage Nova Scotia. And in addition to my work with United Way Halifax, I am a board member uh, and I'm the executive of Engage Nova Scotia. And that I think is a, a demonstration of, of how our organizations have strong alignment and share many values and priorities for our community. And we see the same interconnections uh, in community as well that need to be addressed. On the topic of quality of life, we see the same interconnections between quality of life happens when you have affordability. <laughs> Quality of life happens when you have housing. Quality of life happens when you have individual autonomy and choice and connection, social connection, and also, of course, as the mayor spoke about, inclusion. So we think that there's a rich body of data to be looking at and studying from and learning from. And we're really, really delighted to have an hour, uh, which I think is uh, um, a rarity, and we really, we really appreciate the time of, of this committee to, to have the time to learn about the what I think is the most robust data set of this kind in Canada, if not North America. And I think that's something to be very proud of, uh, as a leading uh, community of HRM. The mayor mentioned as well the economic development strategy for, for Halifax, the growth plan, which we're very excited about. Uh, when you think about the vision of the, 
articulated in that plan, you know, a prosperous growing Halifax that puts the well-being of people and planet first. You know, congratulations on that declaration for our community. We're really excited by that. And again, uh, such strong affinity and alignment between what we're talking about today. So the information that Danny is going to be speaking about from this survey, uh, as I mentioned, is, is unique in Canada. And we have an abundance of riches to have access to this type of content. Um, you know, when we add the layering of this data on top of information that has been important to the Halifax Regional Council, such as Halifax uh, most recently, such as the Poverty Solutions Report, the Growth Plan, all of this content that looks at talking with people and looking at issues, the layering of what we have for access to make good decisions is, is incredible. Um, and a few of the things that we see as being important to this knowledge set that we have is we can not only um, better understand individual and collective needs, we can identify themes and issues that, that need to be addressed in different regions of Nova Scotia and different regions of this municipality and figure out how to dig, dig deeper on those issues. Um, as mentioned, it can really help to inform uh, decision-making, program needs, uh, outreach partnerships, uh, investments, um, shape public policy, which I think is really critical when you have that pulse of how people are feeling and also just help us partner for, for what matters the most um, to all of us, and that's a progressive and inclus inclusive community for all. One of my favorite expressions uh, is, uh, you know, we, we see the world the way we are, not the way it is. And, you know, this, this type of data helps us to, to see the world and see certainly our community objectively and, and broaden our thinking in a way that can really challenge us uh, and excite us about the future. So the question from United Way and the question from Engage, at least from the board, is you know, how do we ensure we maximize this information for good? Uh, so again, thank you. I, I agree with the mayor. It's our responsibility to, to leverage this information and, and use it for good. Uh, and really appreciate the chance to talk with you today and start our brainstorming process of what this can look like. And now over to Danny uh, Graham to walk us through the opportunity in more detail. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and uh, thank you, Council, for the opportunity for us to share a little bit about what it is that we are um, focused on. Uh, Engage Nova Scotia is a small nonprofit uh, that sits at the intersection of the public, private, academic, and community sectors in Nova Scotia. And we're delighted to have the opportunity to share with you a little bit more about what it is that we've been doing in collaboration with many partners across. Uh, the province. Um, our board chair, Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed, uh, who was the uh, assistant uh, chief medical officer, public health physician, uh, would have liked with Sarah as a board member to have been here. But um, we have been incredibly um, grateful for the uh, level of commitment that's been shown across the province and across sectors in the work that. We've all been doing uh, together. And I want to say at the beginning, Madam Chair, that uh, the extra time that you've created for us, and initially, I think, um, when Councillor Lovelace said to me something to the effect of, I love what Engage is doing. Can you just bring it more visibly into view for us at Council? Uh, that really was the impetus for us to sort of say, this is perfect timing for uh, the efforts that we want to um, engage you in. So um, we were just in the last couple of weeks, I've been uh, fortunate to be in the uh, down on the South Shore uh, with the mayors, wardens and councillors and CAOs of the South Shore municipalities. And last week, I was in Cumberland, uh, speaking with the mayors of Cumberland and Amherst about the work like this that is relevant uh, to that region of the province. And we know that as Nova Scotians, there's a leadership role that Halifax Regional Municipality carries along with the province and other levels of government, including the Mi'kmaq, in trying to articulate what the future potentially looks like for us as a uh, people here in Nova Scotia. When I went back in advance of this presentation to sort of the headline issues that you have expressed and some of the questions that you're carefully noodling about an inclusive economy, 
Um, we were really struck by the alignment that exists, we think, between uh, the work that we're trying to do at Engage and uh, the um, work that Council's trying to do, to sort of um, focus on something that really creates, to a certain extent, a different uh, and interesting uh, North Star. So I I'm usually work with uh, Apple Mac products, and I'm going to move to a slide presentation, and I'm going to jump around a little bit. I'm going to go to a live website that exists on our uh, material, and I want to make sure that the technology for this is sufficiently aligned that we can make this happen. So. I don't see my slides on the screen just yet, and there they are. Look at that, just like magic. Um, so um, I'm going to go to full slide view uh, for this, and maybe this first slide is, uh, or the slide after this is the one that uh, matters the most. You'll see that uh, Nova Scotia is, um, we can divide it in many different ways. Um, we uh, have imagined Nova Scotia in many different uh, terms, but the questions that we ask as Nova Scotians have really been sort of uh, at the center of what a good society looks like. We happen to believe that we are fortunate at a global level to uh, live in a place that is unique in its recognition that life is about more than just dollars and cents, and it includes dollars and cents. Um, and in that vein, back in 2015, we asked questions of Nova Scotians in a survey. On a scale of one to 10, we should measure our success by, answer one, growing the economy. A really important sort of element of what uh, people were thinking back at the time. Answer two, improving our quality of life. And you'll see that way back in 2015, on a scale of one to 10, for those people who answered seven to 10, the answers actually shone a light on this notion of quality of life that doesn't get measured very much and frankly doesn't get measured particularly effectively. Now, we want to make uh, certain that these two issues of quality of life and a vibrant economy are interrelated ideas. They don't operate in isolation from each other. But what we also recognize is that what we often see as a proxy for progress is that the economy's improving and therefore everything's good. In fact, what we're about to share with you is a little bit of a, that's not entirely so. That for uh, underrepresented and marginalized communities across Canada and across our province and in HRM, uh, the experiences that everyone has been experiencing is quite different. So when we got this, uh, you'll see that uh, from this previous slide, we asked it pre-pandemic uh, pre and post-pandemic uh, answers relatively similar, perhaps a bigger gap since the pandemic about the priorities that people are placing on uh, these relative questions uh, for us. So that gave us a, a, a bit of a social license, as we call it, to sort of move into this area. And, and I also want to say that it's also been the business community. When you look at this logo soup that we've just popped up for you about who's interested in this, it includes chambers of commerce. It includes uh, regional enterprise networks whose responsibility relates to economic growth and economic dynamism in our regions. But it also includes unlikely allies on logo soup like Amira and Ecology Action as organizations, and municipalities from one end of the province to the other, recognizing that this is an important initiative that we need to move out um, as a Nova Scotia in order to improve people's lives. So I, I, I want to give a shout out to the provincial government uh, for the support that they've provided to uh, this work. Really significant uh, support over a long-standing period of time, dating back 10 years. This is the 10th. Uh, uh, anniversary. This month marks the 10th anniversary of Engage Nova Scotia as an organization. We couldn't have done it without support, but particularly from the province at different stages of all of this. And the community college, with its 13 campuses across the province, have been enormous uh, supporters of our work. And CIW stands for the Canadian Index of Wellbeing, which is one of the global, certainly national, leaders on the questions of what makes a good life for us. They're headquarters at the University of Waterloo, and uh, we love everything about what it is that they're doing. So um, there's a four-part process that I uh, want to describe to you. One relates to this notion of, okay, 
we need to create the room to be able to talk about quality of life, stage one. We think we've done that. Everyone on this uh, logo soup says this is important, let's do it. Stage two has been for us to create a resource. And so um, with the support of many of those partners, um, together in 2019, we created the largest single data set on quality of life and well-being that exists anywhere in North America. The interest that's being expressed in this initiative goes beyond even North America to the OECD and foundations and uh, governments in other parts of the world. But we're excited about this and we still have a lot to share about you know, proving the concept in our own backyards before we put a cape on and pretend that we're ready to sort of take on the world with this uh, particular initiative. But you'll see that for 230 questions, 4,634 residents of HRM answered questions. They took 45 minutes or more to actually give us responses that are reliable to within 1% of a margin of error for your region. And what we'd like to do today is share with you the stories underneath the data, because data is really just stories that have not been fully expressed. So um, we've created step two, this resource, um, which gives you information that can be broken down uh, by different demographic groups, depending on people's living arrangements, age, income, employment, uh, gender, um, and race, race and eth ethnicity, uh, more to say about this, but also touches on many of the questions that are contained in what are loosely described to be eight domains of well-being, according to the Canadian Index of Well-Being. We're gonna go through this in a little more detail because you've been generous in the amount of time that you've given us to talk about all of this. So, step one, uh, license from Nova Scotians to talk about this important issue. Step two, the resource. Now, step three is really about harvesting the resource. And this is where, for us, it feels like that we've cracked the ice on something new. We know that reports are important, and uh, uh, we have created, and on our website exists, hundreds of pages for each of these reports. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about one uh, for HRM in the material that we're sharing in a moment. But, so we've created reports which describe the results of those 4,632 people in HRM and the rest of the province. Um, we've worked with uh, the federal government on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to create a snapshot, 60-page document that actually talks about the SDGs in a Nova Scotia context. So all of that's on the left-hand side of the page. It's the stuff that typically happens in these circumstances. But the breakthrough kind of happened on the tools side of the page, where we've signed a data sharing agreement, this third area right here, with HRM. But uh, we live in, we often talk about the advantages of living in a province where we have uh, enormous capacity in our universities. Well, that came to bear in this. So with PhD students at Dalhousie and the Faculty of uh, Computer Sciences, we've created two tools that we wanna share with you today that are first of their kind anywhere that helps us mine the information underneath the, uh, the results, the resource uh, that we've created. So um, much of what I'm gonna talk about for the remainder of this time will relate to those tools. First of all, uh, the first one that you're going to see uh, will be this thing called a spotlight tool and uh, more to share about exactly what that looks like. And then we're gonna be talking about something called the wellbeing mapping tool uh, in a moment. So, and then we'll come back to the slides. We'll have time for a conversation after our uh, presentation is uh, finished. So, um, uh, to the tools. Um, this is a story that uh, I mentioned that there were a lot of questions. Uh, there were a lot of questions. Uh, that we asked of people across those many domains. And I'm gonna slow us down and take you through the questions and answers related to uh, this. You'll see that uh, this uh, relates to many different regions of the province, and I'm gonna carefully let you see that this is the story of Nova Scotia across regions 
of the province uh, with purples representing concerns and yellows representing things that are commendable in the various regions of uh, Nova Scotia. So you'll see Picto and Cumberland and uh, Colchester and so on, all depicted in all of this. First time this story has been put up about this. Your interests are in the whole province, but predominantly about what's the story inside the region where you, apologies for this failed effort at getting us slightly more, what I can't do, just wanna make sure that we're able to get to the other side of my page here. Um, this is something I wasn't able to do. Yeah, turn that bar. Which bar? Right there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just pull that one. This? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> now I know what I'm doing, sort of. Um, so this is the story uh, that I'm going to take you through with a focus in those yellow bars that you see on things that are of uh, particular interest to any municipality. So this is similar to what we've done with other municipal regions of the province. Uh, let's see if we get it right. Okay. So um, hopefully you can see what's in front of you here. And I'm going to take you through the nature of the questions that uh, are relevant. Um, so for, from, a, from a broad perspective, this notion on a scale of 1 to 10, we asked, how satisfied are you with your life in general? And you'll see that the differences across the regions of Nova Scotia don't vary very much. They're actually, generally speaking, people are consistently of a certain level of happiness. Now, at a global level, we're a very happy lot. I just want to emphasize that. This is a place where people's life satisfaction is higher than almost any other part of the world. Things to say about who's in the top 10, where Canada sits, where our region sits, but generally speaking, Atlantic Canada does well on life satisfaction at a global level. This is the number one organizing question on uh, this particular issue. But I want to take, I'm going to take you through the different types of questions and invite you to pay particular attention to those things that I've highlighted in yellow as important municipal considerations for uh, the work that you are uh, doing. So in general, these issues relate to matters, I'm just going to go back because I want to get that, you know, uh, feelings of safety from crime as a, um, as an issue. So this is a broad picture that you will see of people's um, social connections, if you will. This is, this is sort of the broad way that we describe this. So are people feeling lonely? Do they feel connected to the community? Do they trust others? Do they feel safe at night? Do they feel isolated? If they had a problem, would somebody help them? These are really important questions. And when we did the examination of this as an issue, it shows up as being something that's critically important, even more important than people's physical health to their well-being generally. So if we were to invite you, and we'll come back to this, I've got a slide that talks about social infrastructure, parks, the stuff that developed Nova Scotia and others are talking about, about bringing people together to see each other, to meet each other, to be in connection with each other. It's actually really important that we create an environment where people are intersecting as much as possible. So. Um, the next uh, level of questions generally relate to uh, trust and confidence in institutions. And you'll see that we, it would not be meaningful unless we talked about experiences that people have of a trust in local government. So you'll see generally HRM sort of washing out with the average. I don't want you to become fixated on things that are happening in CBRM. We'll speak to CBRM Council about uh, the differences that show up for them, but some issues related to them feeling connected as a society to the rest of the province actually show up as uh, issues for uh, that particular region. But trust in neighbors, trust in institution, government, media, business, schools, justice, police, all showing up as uh, an important issue. So we know that matters related to policing are important to you as a region. So lots to be understood. I'm going to come back to this on a, on a more micro 
uh, data place where we provided some uh, further research about the experience of women and trust and confidence in policing uh, across your different regions of HRM, but just wanted to let you know that lots of really important and interesting questions. So we know as well that having an inclusive HRM depends on people's uh, self-reported experiences of discrimination. So this particular set of six questions tells you the story of how people are feeling in your region as a whole relative to uh, the issues of discrimination based on ethnicity, religion, uh, sexual orientation, age, gender, and disability. Lots to say, and I'm not highlighting this in our slides about uh, disabilities, but lots to talk about on this uh, particular matter. At a, at a pan-provincial level, uh, it, it, there's a saying that I'm going to repeat a few times, and it is that geography matters, but demography matters more. But as it relates to the issue of geography, folks in your region trust and are, have fewer concerns about the healthcare system in Nova Scotia relative to the rest of the province. Generally speaking, there is a higher sense of the healthcare system working here than exists in other parts of Nova Scotia. Lots to say about the different regions, CBRM standing out as strongly the region of the province where people are quite unhappy uh, relative to this. Lots of questions about whether, you know, the, the democratic engagement, you know, have the programs or services of the local government made you better off? You'll see where you uh, rate. Don't obsess about trying to absorb all of this right now. Just sort of imagine what's possible when you receive the Excel sheets that are available now for you to explore on a deeper uh, basis. So environmental uh, questions are also important to uh, HRM. Issues with respect to whether or not people uh, recycle are important uh, to you from, for all matters, uh, whether and how people use transit. And I, I'm just going to put an asterisk beside this. One would expect that people use public transit more in HRM than they do in other regions. So this question is kind of a washout where the need for public transportation is greater in your region than it is in other areas, but just flagging that as a uh, general notion. And then for those of us who are really committed to the notion of the importance of having facilities, rec, culture, libraries, historic places, festivals to attend, we have a really rich number of questions that show up for us here. And with the exception of Antigonish guys, bro, um, there is a bit of an urban-rural split here, where people's satisfaction with the accessibility of facilities is clearly higher in HRM as a whole than it is in other regions of Nova Scotia. So uh, lots to share. You can explore about where those challenges exist uh, generally, but in general, people are happier. And that's consistent with what often happens in urban settings where you have a higher concentration of people and they, um, the, the scale at which you can build facilities is obviously more economical than it is in regions that are widely uh, spread out. But it also shows up for access to education. Um, so people's experience of being able to upgrade their education in HRM, again, consistently higher than it is in uh, other parts of uh, the region. And then as it relates to all things tied to um, jobs and work, um, these questions give you a feel for, okay, and, and just note the difference in the shades of the purple. Jobs and work issues across the province, generally speaking, are consistent uh, for uh, people generally. And we know how much you have gnashed your teeth and worried about issues of um, poverty, housing, and shelter. Um, and so we just want to give you a, a quick view of the issues related to affordability for uh, Nova Scotians generally across regions. And you'll see that in this regard, in general, the aggregate. Now, we know how many people are answering, and we want to be more precise about the who question inside of this. In general, uh, the story in Halifax, 
is not worse than it is in other parts of Nova Scotia as it relates to one's ability to pay the mortgage or rent, self-perceptions. Again, this is 2019, and I'm going to be coming back to the notion that we want to be resurveying in 2024 about this. But the highlighted line there is about uh, people's uh, ability to pay rent or mortgage in the last year or being able to eat a, a whether they actually ate less. So this is a, this is a question that I'm going to shift to in a moment because we know this is critically important. Are people actually in a prosperous province like Nova Scotia or a region like yours eating less? The answer is yes, they do. And it's not about the aggregate, it's about the, it's about the uh, story that they have as individuals because of their circumstances. So just taking you back to I'm just going to finish this by saying time adequacy shows up. You're going to actually see time adequacy as the ability to enjoy life. Let's just take a moment, take a breath, and consider what, what actually is fulfilling for us as humans. And it's about having the opportunity to spend time uh, with others we love, to socialize, to prepare meals, to do those things that are relevant. In general, the population across the province is doing similarly, but when you get to different populations of Nova Scotia, by income, by age, by household arrangement, the stories change quite dramatically, which brings us back to that phrase that you're going to hear me talk about before. Geography matters, um, but demography matters more. And so I'm going to take you to the demography questions. Uh, I'm going to switch slides. Everything's going to stay the same. And the first thing you're going to see when I pull up this slide is this, the average experience of people in your region. So I'm going to repeat this slide, but then when I go to these next slides, I'm going to break it down by people's age, uh, by people's different living experiences, and you'll see that these yellows disappear largely. And for people who are experiencing life on the margins, there aren't any yellows. There are just concerns. So um, here's the demographic domains uh, that exist uh, across your region of the province. And I'm just going to give you this quick sense with apologies for my imperfect scrolling. I Councillor, it's wonderful to have you for whatever period of time you're able to make it here. Yeah. <laughs> so um, here's the story uh, for people who are, uh, here's, here, this is what you've seen already. Generally, you'll see muted sort of purples and yellows all through uh, all of this. But if you want to grow the population in HRM and hit those targets that you're talking about, we need to understand the story of people who are new to the community in the last five years. And so for those people in your region, here are the answers that they are giving us about whether or not they feel welcome uh, fully. And, you know, it's... This is a, th I'm not suggesting that this is necessarily a bad thing. There's something about people arriving anew, being young often, who are saying, it's tough. So I don't want to sort of, we're not here to throw stones about HRM's ability to be welcoming. We are, however, pointing to the need for this to be addressed if we're going to grow the population and meet many of the objectives that the partnership and others are uh, sharing about the importance of population growth uh, for you. So taking you uh, quickly through this, you'll see that new to community in the last five years, and by the way, this would be people who moved from Glace Bay to Cole Harbor, and this would be people who moved from Rwanda or uh, to uh, HRM in the last five years that show up in this particular column, column N, uh, that I'm showing here. What's interesting is that they actually use the facilities. Note these yellows that are pouring up here. So they, this is our interpretation of what shows up in this column and this column and these, is that they're trying to get out into the community to say, hey, I'm here, I want to be connected more, and they're using your facilities. Um, but there's something about the other experiences of feeling like they belong to it that are a greater concern uh, for them 
uh, more generally. And then when you get down to issues, uh, just going to focus on this, you'll see that once we get into affordability and the questions that they have regarding the, whether they can afford to meet their needs in society, we're back to the purples. And uh, much stronger purples than existed, all of these above decimal two for sure, are statistically significant experiences for new people to your community. So just sharing that that's, that's their life. So um, in the interest of time, I'm going to speed you through these other sort of demographic uh, profiles of people in your region. And again, with apologies for my scrolling, whoa, big apologies. Um, I'm going to take you back to the big story. And that is that um, here we, we, we've got this broken down based on housing, uh, older adults, uh, disabilities, and many other issues. But um, we just shared with you the story of people who have arrived in HRM for the last five years. Um, look at the experiences that are had by young adults between the ages of 16 and 30 in uh, your region. And I'm just going to scroll down so that you see lots to pay attention to about them not feeling like they're part of the community. This is the all the pink stuff here. They are not particularly feeling like they are part of uh, HRM society uh, on the whole. Again, they use the facilities. I'm just going to go to the facilities questions. You'll see the yellows showing up. So they're trying to get out and be part of the parks and recreation and various other things. But as it relates to here are things for young adults in your region, they are saying, don't feel like I'm, I feel alone, lonely, no sense of belonging. Don't feel like government works for me. I'm struggling to um, be able to put food on the table, pay for rent. I'm just going to go to those issues. Look at those, these deep purples that I'm sh just highlighting here. This is, these are the questions of young people in your region on the questions of affordability. So really striking things and even time adequacy. So flexible work hours and related issues. Really a time pressure uh, that they are feeling. Um, so uh, won't go into this in finer detail, but for people with household incomes, below $40,000, and for families being led by, and I really want to be careful about the language that I use, at least, related to this. These are leaders. These are, these are families that are being led four times more likely by women than men, five times more likely to be renters than owners who are experiencing challenges that we need to get on top of. Uh, if we're going to have the inclusive society that we want for single parents and, and, as importantly, the children who are part of the families that are being led by single parents. So all of this is available to you uh, to uh, consider as an HRM as a whole kind of uh, issue. And it's this, this information, frankly, is not available to any other municipality of your size in North America. You've got it, and we hope that we are now able to work with it to bring about a more inclusive uh, HRM as a whole. But it's not just, it doesn't just uh, rest there. We are fortunate that with, I mentioned Dalhousie and the amazing work that uh, we've been able to do with the um, Faculty of Computer Sciences at Dalhousie. And, you know, shout out to, um, uh, Leonardo Cristino, who moved here from Brazil and is doing his PhD at the Faculty of Computer Sciences, and his mentor, Fernando Polovich, uh, at the Faculty of Computer Sciences, and Taylor Hill, all parts of our team in this effort that we're doing through a MITAX agreement uh, with Dalhousie to make this possible. They've created this tool that really starts to crack the nut at a more granular level about the story that exists inside of Nova Scotia. So we don't have enough time to go through the hundreds of questions and the 50 different regions of the province where we've got lots of information loaded in. But I'm going to take you just to one. Uh, but know that there are hundreds of questions that are 
possible for you to explore. And the one that I think I'm able to find here, apologies if I can't, quickly, relates to the story of people's experience, perceptions of safety and trust. So there's lots of questions that, uh, this, is, this is available on our website and, and city planners from HRM joined the launch of this a month ago on May 31st at a conference where there were 170 or so people who were all mapping people who got really jazzed up about what we've been able to create in all of this. Again, many from your region. And uh, we showed them this tool. So of the hundreds of questions, I'm just going to one, and it relates to the question of how safe do you feel when you're out alone in your neighborhood after dark? Uh, so an important question, obviously, from an, a municipal perspective. I'm gonna continue to click, apologies for the speed of this, and you'll see that very quickly, we have something that gives us a feel across many postal codes of Nova Scotia. This is all these postal codes that are gonna be uh, considered across Nova Scotia. And with a small click of a map, this is available, again, for residents in Nova Scotia right now. I'm just gonna click on this uh, Atlas Globe something, and you'll see that um, the story for Nova Scotia as a whole shows up where, generally speaking, people feel very safe, 39.7 in the province as a whole and 22.3 feels safe generally. So good news that's operating across the province for this. But we really wanna understand this story at a more granular level, and especially for you in HRM. And uh, that allows us to go to this map, and I'm just gonna shrink it down and say, okay, we know the story for the province as a whole. What's the story in your neighborhood? So. This is, Pam, I see you smiling, because this is, this is part of where uh, Deputy Mayor Lovelace's uh, questions came. HRM is not a, a monolithic something where the experiences in every one of your districts is exactly the same. It's actually a tapestry of many different stories that we're granulating to, uh, stories that show up uh, differently uh, across your many regions. And so, um, this hopefully gives, it's, it's the broad picture of HRM. And you can see that as we click on the different postal codes, so this is the, still the question of how safe do you feel when you're out alone in your neighborhood at dark, and we can scroll around and see the stories that are peninsular, uh, B3K, B3H, and B3J clustered together, and we actually, when it's statistically reliable, we're, you know, we put B4A, B3B, and B2R all together so that you understand uh, those stories, and we can actually group them. If you want uh, suburban and urban and uh, uh, rural parts of HRM that you want to cluster to sort of understand the stories, that too can be something that you can do across every one of the questions that we've uh, loaded in here. And for those who are geographically challenged, uh, and want to see through map transparency where in Dartmouth, Bedford, uh, Sackville, and other regions of the province we see this. There's a fancy pants um, device that gives you a feel for what this uh, potentially looks like. So that's the tool. That's, that's a, this doesn't exist uh, also any place else. And uh, it's, it's not a place so much as pride is gratitude that we have for the brilliance that exists in our universities and the relationships that we've been able to create through MyTax and others that launch this and give you new information that gets you back to a place of, okay, I wanna make a difference in my home community and really try to uh, uh, do something different. So, um, oh, sorry, uh, I'll just go back to that. Yeah, so um, th this answer is, uh, so the question is here, how safe do you feel when you're out alone? Um, and this answer is a pan-provincial one, uh, very safe uh, that people feel. Here is the scale here, very safe down to very unsafe. And the color legend 
counselor is connected to this yellow that is high, and the darker colors represent in this particular one more concerns. So the brighter the color, generally speaking, across these regions, the safer people feel. The, the darker the color, and, and one wants to be cautious about over-interpreting that dark colors are suddenly bad and dangerous. They're just different. And so we want to highlight the difference as opposed to the magnitude of that difference. That requires further interpretation. These are sensing tools that give us a feel for it. So don't, when you, if you go to your district and you see a darker color than you might see in other regions, what you're able to say is, it's different in my region, and how statistically significant is it different is something for further analysis by staff or others about what shows up in all of that. Does that help? I just, I was just getting confused with the yellow and the, the green, the blues and the yep. greens. Got it. Yeah, it's this bar right here that's the one that uh, really gives you the scale of difference. Okay, uh, back to the sort of a, an attempt to summarize and uh, meet the time uh, at the right uh, hit associated with this. Uh, you may be wondering about what's the story of uh, underrepresented marginalized communities uh, inside of this. And so just to let you know that in, when we were uh, advancing this survey, we identified communities of people who historically, and for good reason, don't trust and commit themselves to answering surveys young people, 2SLBGTQ uh, communities, African Nova Scotians, the Mi'kmaq, and uh, people who are, have low incomes and so, that sort of thing. So we made an extra effort through various means, happy to describe what that is, to um, understand and build the trust uh, for this. We're resurveying in 2024, and, and if there is a success variable that we're really wanting to hit, it relates to wanting to increase the participation from those underrepresented marginalized communities. And at the same time, we feel that we've been relatively successful in the efforts that we've done to make that happen. But we're also working on a, for communities that have been burned in the past, a bit of a nothing about us without us kind of mindset. So we're working with, for example, uh, the uh, African Nova Scotian communities of Nova Scotia in partnership around Here's what we found. Here's what that spotlight that you've just seen disaggregates for you, which points to things that don't surprise the community, but still need to be fully understood in order for the community to feel like they are partners in this instead of it being done to them, for them, separate from them, and making this happen. So lots of work to continue to advance in uh, making that happen. Excuse me, presenter. Uh through you, Chair, to the councillors. I just want to remind you that we will have 30 minutes for questions after the meeting. And presenter, you have 15 minutes left. I don't think I'll need all of that. So we'll have all of the time that we uh, need. So I just wanted to point to that, more to say on the underrepresented and uh, uh, related communities, um, if uh, that's of interest to you. And you might be asking, okay, how does HRM compare to other large municipalities in uh, the country? And so if quality of life is intuitively a differentiator for us as a region, can we say that? Is it demonstrably so? And uh, frankly, that's for further analysis at another time, but we used a number of years ago StatsCan information about uh, quality of life for urban settings in Canada. Uh, and we disaggregated 14 different regions of, or 14 different regional municipalities essentially across Canada. And um, HRM does well. Um, so of those 14, it was almost tied for second with Ottawa and Quebec City being the first of those uh, larger municipalities where quality of life was something that people in those regions expressed to be something that's relatively high. There is another story as well, and that is that globally in Canada as well, um, life satisfaction is higher in suburban settings than they are in urban settings. So 
was something unique about HRM is that there is that rural, suburban, and urban sort of mix. And we're not sure what it means, but it amplifies the importance of getting more granular in understanding what is it inside of HRM that's really happening that needs to get uh, improved over time. So generally speaking, the last analysis that we did, happy to do more, and this is relevant to the priorities if the partnership is standing up subjective well-being, which is really the measurement that they're talking about around quality of life. You remember population, uh, economic growth, and quality of life are the three sort of standards that they've shown. And uh, so we've been working with them to help understand how do we make sure that quality of life is something that continues to rise. And it doesn't just rise with those of us, I count myself amongst them, who love this place and enjoy the advantages of it, but there are questions that we're holding about the gap between, to use Alexander Keith's term, those who like it, like it a lot, I'm amongst them, but those who don't, don't. And, and there are questions that emerged for us in some early analysis about the gap between uh, having a greater gra gap in Nova Scotia about really happy people and really unhappy people. And so closing the gap and identifying those populations of people who are struggling from our perspective is critical to sort of meet those sort of branding objectives that this is a great place to live. It's got to be a great place to live for everyone in order for us to actually be able to back that up and not just great for those who have advantages and privilege um, would be the, the general perspective that as an organization we would have. Um, so we've done um, some, uh, we, we, we've been fortunate to have partnerships all across the province, by sector, by geography, and elsewhere, HRM being really critical to all of that. And so we have been working with engagement activities at a pan-provincial level in regions. We've been working in classrooms with universities on research projects. We've got research projects just this week. We heard from the University of Waterloo that was, they just published a paper on our data for Nova Scotia about the experiences of older adults and their challenges related to social isolation tied to our data. So. You know, a, a university in Paris uh, did work uh, on uh, the information uh, related to this as well. We've been working with um, all, virtually all of the key provincial government departments on the relevance of this. In the last two weeks, I think I've done presentations to four or five of the senior teams at um, yesterday it was Community Culture, Tourism and Heritage. Last week it was Department of Community Services, Service Nova Scotia, um, Labor and Immigration coming up, um, Health and Wellness, Education and Early Childhood Development. They're all interested and invested. So the potential for the collaborations with the provincial parties that also have a stake in this, I think is more alive than it's ever been. And we're fortunate this SDG project that we uh, have done tied to global objectives, 17 goals uh, related to making literally a better world for contribution agreements, 300 applications. This is going to sound proud, but I, 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 this is a, a nod to our team that uh, helped create the application. Federal government received 300 applications for three-year contribution agreements related to the sustainable development goals developed by the United Nations. And we were one of 11 that were chosen to have this particular project sort of get advanced. And we know that HRM is focused on SDGs as a something. We're generally happy to talk more in a granular sense about what that looks like. But the middle bubble there relates to targeted reports um, that are done often by request. And we're really excited that the requests have been coming in from parties in HRM more often than they've been coming from other regions of the problem. Perhaps that's predictable. And these are examples of three of the targeted reports that we have done for HRM in partnership with um, other uh, parties. They're self-describing, and I see typos. Man, how did I manage that? Um, uh, especially in the first bullet. Uh, but let's ignore that uh, for the moment. But you'll see that it's, you know, downtown Dartmouth, St. St. Margaret's Bay, community health boards across different sectors, business uh, focus, social connections uh, focus. But this last report, and this is a nod to, again, 
um, my colleague Taylor Hill, who I mentioned earlier, who's our research coordinator. And when um, uh, HRM staff said, can you tell us a story from your information about the story of women around a variety of questions in HRM? And we said, we'll give it a try. And using uh, a different technology than the ones that we've described, something called ArcGIS, uh, we managed to sort of look at the stories of women in HRM across this vast number of uh, uh, questions that show up in your uh, survey. Um, so I'm going to give you a very quick look at what those uh, look like and just give you a a slight feel for it. So apologies for the speed at which I'm going to be going through uh, this, but it's going to relate to things like uh, confidence in policing uh, for women across these many different regions. Um, here's the uh, here's the report, and it, this is available. It's in the materials that you've received, and that table of contents that I mentioned a moment ago is right here. Um, but you'll see as we scroll through this that I'm going to go a little quicker. I'm not going to do this track button. I'm going to say, OK, we've got stories that relate to feelings of social isolation for women across these many different reasons, Fall River, Sackville area, Bedford, Halifax, Sambro. And then we've got the peninsula area. You'll see broken out into the box that's on the left-hand side. This particular issue is about feelings of isolation are scaled from 3.27 to 2.97. Oh, sorry uh, for the for this. I'm just randomly sort of choosing pages, and apologies for that. Experiences of gender discrimination uh, across your region. Again, a 70-page report already in the can, ready for you to read if this is of importance uh, for you to sort of understand that, again, back to the point about whether or not HRM is, is a single unit or whether it's uh, something greater. This is actually an important one. So this is trust in local or municipal government by gender across all of those regions. And you'll see that there are differences uh, for uh, you as you go along. I want to respect the time and I'd like to close out and uh, get back to the big picture associated with uh, what it is that Sarah and I are trying to imagine for you in general. This is, if, if there's anything that we would emphasize to be sort of the big picture something, it is generally that the municipality, the province, the feds, philanthropists have a lot of money. And they're, we've got enough money in our society to fix the challenges that we have. Largely, it relates to political and local interests and priorities. What we're able to bring, we think, with this is evidence that allows for you to be in a more, to, to make public dollar, allow for public dollars to be used most effectively on what's important and what interventions are going to uh, happen most effectively. So this has implications for budgeting, evaluation, and so on if you step into it. Um, this is your plan on a page. We're delighted that quality of life is at the top line of what it is for your vision uh, for a municipality. That aligns perfectly with what it is that we want to do. We know that these are issues that are of importance to you. Uh, we're just randomly selected. Inclusive economy, yesterday's discussion uh, for full council, population growth, housing, all of these issues we would be able to inform with a dig of some sort. And I just want to go back to this notion of social infrastructure and I, with a nod to partners that the United Way and us have, where as we plan for the growth of the city, we cannot lose sight of the importance of bringing citizens together somewhat randomly in parks and the waterfront and other places where they actually intersect with each other. Because if we don't have people talking to each other laterally, we're going to be in, we're going to have a, as a society that's not nearly as inclusive as uh, we all want it to be. So uh, here's my final slide uh, before the discussion, and it just generally relates to next steps. Um, what could we do uh, with relevant branches of HRM? How do we dig in? Um, how do you use this on an ongoing basis? And this is something that um, 
Paul Johnston and Connor O'Day of your staff and I have been talking about, about how do you create that center of excellence so that the resolution that you passed about work with Research Nova Scotia, from our perspective, really embeds the potential for our work to be included in what it is that they are imagining so that you actually work from that evidence base more effectively. We'll see where that goes. Uh, what additional questions in the 2024 uh, survey should be considered? What questions might you want to ask about housing, social infrastructure, discrimination or whatever annually so that we don't have to wait every uh, five years? What dives do you want staff to go into uh, right now? And what's the ongoing relationship uh, between us? And uh, we've been fortunate to have had a great relationship with Council. Uh, it dates back some period of time. There is a specific thing related to the Quality of Life Initiative where we were fortunate to receive funding and then when the pandemic hit, um, there, as the mayor said, there was a commitment to an additional amount of money and I don't know if this is entirely as altruistic as it might sound as I portray this, but it was that we saw that HRM was saying, we're gonna be short on money. And so as an organization, we said, let's press pause button on asking you for that second commitment that you had and haven't realized on that uh, amount, relatively modest amount, but there's a, a, a still bigger and larger scale question about the relationship, including the financial relationship, that we welcome exploring with you and with staff uh, as this moves forward. What it becomes is uh, really for us to decide together. If we're excited about what the potential is for this to improve people's lives, then the sky's the limit about uh, what's possible to make happen from here. So I'm tired of hearing me talk. Um, and I want to see the chair back perhaps over to Sarah to sort of uh, invite whatever additional reflections you might have before we open it up for the full discussion with everyone. There's one minute left. Okay. Oh. I'll be very fast uh, because I think I'm like uh, Danny want to get to some discussion. The only point I wanted to say is I think the information speaks for itself, right? You can, there's a lot there to unpack. And the only other comment that Danny made about uh, feeling gratitude for the community that we're in that we're able to have this information, and he said I didn't, didn't want it to be pride. I think it's okay to have a little bit of pride about it too. And so I, I just wanted to lean into that comment that this has been a unique collection of individuals uh, from community, from government, from our educational institutions who have actually created the conditions to support an organization like Engage Nova Scotia to make sure that we actually have this. And I think it's, it speaks to who, who we are and what we believe in. So I think a little bit of pride is a good thing, um, especially if that helps to shine a light on the amazing place that we live. Thank you. Awesome, thank you both very much. Fascinating information. And we have speakers on the speaker list. So go ahead, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you so much for this. If uh, you can indulge me for uh, some unparliamentary language, that was friggin' amazing. <laughs> um, that is, uh, you know, just having that access to this information uh, will. I mean, that's a, it's a game changer. It really is. Um, I do I do have a few questions. Um, first of all, love to have uh, Engage present on that 73-page uh, women's study to our Women's Advisory Committee. So uh, we'll uh, take note of that and uh, get you on the uh, on the agenda soon because uh, I think that that information will help guide uh, that group as they move forward with their policy development. So uh, we'll, uh, I'll, get the, I'll get on to that. Um, the, uh, speaking of, uh, of men and women, the, uh, the online tool that you showed us in particular when you're discussing uh, the, uh, the safety, I know it's broken down in uh, postal codes, but uh, as you said, geography matters, but demography matters more. Is there also the opportunity to break that information down, responses from men and women? Yes, okay, perfect. Um, and so just uh, two other comments slash questions. Uh, so this data set, uh, the questionnaires, this was done in 2019. So now while you guys were crunching those numbers, the world flipped upside down. Um, are you expecting to have 
uh, a lot of changes when uh, you do this again in 24. Uh, can, do you still stand by the 1% uh, margin of error uh, allowing for the, uh, the pandemic? And my second uh, question comment is that, uh, you know, we worked so hard to keep our young people in HRM. I know that that was a, uh, a personal goal for, uh, for Mike, for Mayor Savage. Um, you know, but given the results and the data presented here today, are we on the verge of losing them again? Right. And uh, that's, those are my two comments, questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, first, as it relates to the pandemic, uh, we've been in regular conversations with our uh, partners at the Canadian in Index of Wellbeing and what they have noted when they have, they've done this work, um, a, uh, probably 15 or so times across the country. The rate of response in HRM is the highest that they have ever received from a municipality. Uh, just want to record that. Um, uh, so this notion that quality of life as something that people will respond to is, I think, deeply in the soil of our residents. Yeah. Um, what they've noted since the pandemic began is that the patterns generally about the populations of people who are um, who have been falling behind and slipping between the cracks remains generally consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but the magnitude of the experiences that people have are greater uh, after the pandemic. And so life satisfaction has uh, dropped significantly across Canada. And a, a couple of issues that are we're paying attention to um, relate to the following, that as an aggregate if, and this is a conversation we've had with uh, the provincial government, but it's obviously highly relevant to HRM more generally. Sure. It is that um, if there were five bell alarms that existed before the uh, pandemic, the number one one was self-reported mental well-being. Mm. And it's uh, what we hear from our partners at the CIW is that that's not surprisingly taken a significant hit. Yeah. Affordability was the number two issue. And then the third one, and it's why we're, you know, you might be familiar with work we've done around share Thanksgiving, do a thing from me to you, these small projects that we've been doing to try to create social connections. Mm. All things related to sense of community, sense of belonging, loneliness, trust in others, trust in institutions. If we could emphasize anything to council and public leaders, it is that that requires attention and it might seem soft and nobody's been talking about it for a long period of time, but bringing people together is gonna to be really important. And there were some studies done after the Spanish flu 100 years ago about what needs to be done by a Swedish uh, person. He's, they said social connections, bringing people back together is critically important in those first five years after the pandemic that happened before. We think that's gonna be important as we move forward. Yeah. So generally, we are gonna be resurveying in 2024 um, with the support of our partners, and we will see how much things have changed. We think that the story for uh, older adults in Nova Scotia probably has changed because of their living circumstances. Generally speaking, they were, um, I don't wanna sound glib, they were a happier lot uh, than younger people. Um, but they've been isolated for a, a more intensively than others. So there is a concern that they have dropped more precipitously uh, than others. As it relates to the young people, um, that pattern is consistent with what StatsCan is producing about the concerns that exist amongst young people. So if anything, I think that we have the potential to be a more attractive place for young people over time. But we just need to sort of reflect that we're prioritizing the things that they are struggling with in order to ensure that they stay here uh, and come here more often. Beautiful, thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Vice Chair Cuddle. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Danny, for the work that you and the board have put into doing, you know, collecting this information and presenting it. You know, it's a, uh, um, anyway, it's after my own heart. I, I used to teach uh, qualitative and quanti quantitative uh, data research and analysis at Dow in planning, in the planning school. 
specifically because the qualitative information is what gives the quantitative information the context, the meaning, and the story. And so while we're sitting here talking about housing specifically and the number of units that we need or you know traffic stats about pedestrian safety, it, 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 it's not meaningful unless we have we start to create the communities where that are healthy socially connective and inclusive it's not it's not just about shelter it's about it's about the whole picture and and we need to be having these discussions at council we need to be having them throughout hrm and within our communities so this work is a kind of a a great platform to introduce those subjects and that thinking you know, in particular, you know, I spend a lot of time here on council thinking about like how how can we bring this information into our strategic thinking? In, in many ways, I I felt stifled as a councillor in the conversations we are able to have, like sitting around in this format with five minutes to speak and three minutes to speak, and not being able to collectively sit down in a room and dig into the data and set our priorities. Even that list of, of priorities that you've listed, we're kind of done one month into our terms on the fly in this room. And they're mo very much coming from our intuitive understanding of our communities. And so I'm really interested in digging into this data and seeing what the priorities are in the population that you're finding. And even having that summary of like, here are some key areas where we can make a difference in moving that metric from the dark purple to you know something more pos more positive. Um, it's just for me. It's like how do we use this as as a council in a real way, um, you know, and and that's another conversation, um, because the information also is how you connect all the dots across all those pieces. You know, so for example, I have a community center in Terrence Bay that needs a new kitchen and they host seniors meals. All of a sudden you've given me information that says senior isolation is a real thing. And when we're making these arguments for, for you know, areas of need in our community, having this data to back it up that you know, this isn't just a, a bun fight over where dollars should go, it's actually something as a, as a council, as a city, we know we need to address and here's how we're doing it. Um, I, I, you know, these are different ways I see us being able to apply this um, this information that you've collected. So I'm I'm so excited uh, that we have it, that we have the maps. I know there's more drilling down to do. If I look at a place like Spryfield, um, when I was teaching, I would use census tracts, right? And you'd have a census tract of Spryfield, and we looked average, but you break it down into the dissemination areas, and we have one of the most wealthy areas in the city and one of the poorest, right? And when you put it together, you get a nice happy average, right? So data, you know, it is drilling down into the numbers and, and really uh, kind of developing that deeper understanding of place. And um, I would love to do that more. I can't wait to dig into it and kind of bring my understanding to the data and, s and see how, I, how we can pull it out and bring more meaning to it. Um, so I could say so much more, but I have a motion that I'd like to put on the floor. Um, and I move that the Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee recommend that Regional Council, one, award a grant of $40,000 to support the work of Engage Nova Scotia, and two, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to instruct staff to prepare a staff report with recommendations on formalizing the relationship between Halifax Regional Municipality and Engage Nova Scotia with the intent to provide the municipality with information to better understand the needs and well-beings of citizens in HRM. Thank you, seconded by Linda, uh, Councillor Smith. Uh, go ahead. Um, oh yeah, I get more time now. Um, <laughs> um, that's that's great. Um, you know, uh, I just want to say how you know the, the quality of the work that's done here is is amazing. I you know, Danny, I said to you earlier today that I wouldn't be sitting in this chair if it wasn't for the work that you've been doing in the province of Nova Scotia over the last 
two decades, I guess, that, that I've, that I've known you and been aware of it. Um, it adds such amazing value. And I, you know, just the presentation that you gave us here today and the enthusiasm to see reports go to other committees of council, I think all of regional council should have the opportunity to dig, in, to dig into this report and be familiar with it. Um, so I am, I'm, I'm very happy to put this motion on the floor and I uh, don't think I need to say much more about how enthusiastic I am. Um, I think we can just go to the vote. <laughs> Does anyone have any question, comment yet? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Councillor Blackburn. No, I just have a, a quick question about the uh, the uh, the motion, uh, and this might be a question for uh, for legal. Um, do we have the ability to uh, uh, recommend awarding of the grant, or do we have to put a, a staff or a staff report in as part of that motion, or is it okay as it stands? Uh, Madam Chair, through you to the Councillor, I'm just going to look at AO1 uh, with respect to that. Um, no, uh, there is a request for a staff report there, mm. um, but with respect to the grant, um, as we know, budget's already uh, finished, so right. uh, the question is um, it may have to go to audit and finance, uh, yeah. but uh, I'll, I'll just have a quick look at AO1 with respect to that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Blackburn. Any other questions or comments on this? To the motion. To the motion. Um, yeah, could I just have a piece there? Sure. Um, actually, uh, Danny spoke to it uh, earlier that this additional 40,000, that there are two installments of 40,000 that were already approved um, pre pandemic. And it was during the pandemic that the second installment was kind of put on hold and said, to your point, I think you said you said you, we were looking for for ways to save some money, and you said we you didn't need the money that year. So this has already been approved at regional council. Um, it's just putting it back on the table to say let's let's um, honor our commitment and. Um, and award the second half of the funding we had already approved. Okay, thank you very much, Vice Chair. We'll just uh, wait for legal to come up with a recommendation with that. Madam Chair, through you to the council, um, the, the, I think the question is whether or not there's money in the current budget for, I, I, I appreciate that uh, there may have been a deferral, but I'm uh, unaware of, of what might be in the current budget with respect to that. Uh, I, I would um, suggest that the um, motion can go ahead and executive council uh, agenda review can look at uh, what, perhaps what might need to happen with respect to where this motion goes with respect to the uh, the funding piece of it. Okay. Does that work, uh, Vice Chair? Kendall? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we're just making a recommendation yeah. to, to regional council, so we're not actually approving the, right. the money at this yeah. point. Yeah. Okay, then. So um, I guess we'll call for the question. Question? Okay. All in favor? Say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion passed. Thank you. And we will move on to Deputy Mayor. My turn, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Madam Chair, for, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I appreciate that. Um, I am just gonna pull up my notes because as you were presenting, I was, of course, typing 
madly so that I could capture as much. Uh, so we met Danny, uh, I think it was 2014 uh, when we did uh, Engage Nova Scotia had step up events across the province. Those are great opportunities to engage citizens in municipal government, in their community, to understand um, you know, what it meant to be engaged. And these are really important conversations. Uh, you know, and we had all ages at these events. Uh, people from throughout all backgrounds coming and talking about what they loved about their community, what they what they struggled with in their community. So, you know, fast forward to this survey. Um, this data is phenomenal. This is an excellent opportunity right now. Huge shout out um, to my tax and the work that they've been doing. Um, you know, this is <laughs> the, we're setting a bar here, uh, really, for the rest of the country. And uh, I am excited actually, and, and uh, Councillor Smith, I'm not sure if there's an opportunity to bring this to FCM as, uh, as a learning tool, um, but uh, for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to say, hey guys, look what we got. <laughs> um, because the, the way that we could integrate policy uh, approaches and policy development from this data, understanding the story of our communities is exceptional. This is, this is a great opportunity. Um, when I saw the numbers, very very quickly, and I was looking at uh, you know the ages, 16 years and above. Getting 16 year, year old, uh, 17 and 18 year old students to have their voices heard, that's very powerful, especially since they are denied the right to vote, right? And so you know it's, this, this is a tool that we could potentially use to push uh, the provincial government forward to give young people the right to vote. And also, you know, every opportunity I have to also talk about the importance of um, permanent residents as well to have the right to vote. So thinking about, you know, those those newcomers and they're not feeling so welcome, right? There's this overall um, uh, barrier and that is what I'm hearing on the street. You know, the uh, depending on where they are in the municipality, they don't necessarily have the opportunity to feel welcome. Um, and so some of the uh, nonprofit groups or some of those neighborhood community groups need assistance maybe or need some help um, in, uh, in crossing some of those cultural or, or language barriers. Um, so just thinking about ways that we could take some of that data and ensure that our racialized communities, uh, Muslim, Asian, Indigenous, et cetera, have that opportunity to um, to, to, to breach any of those barriers so they do feel welcome. Um, the United Nations SDG count, wouldn't it be great if we had a tool to reflect how well we're doing? I'm um, looking at you, Sarah. I think that that, you know, being able to, for the United Way to say, hey, look, this is, this is the work that we're doing. Here's the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and this is how we're moving that bar forward. That would be awesome. Um, and for the Women's Quality of Life report, I will be at that advisory committee meeting. Uh, Councillor Blackburn would love to, to have that report um, presented. And just thinking about ways that we could um, bring this data to life and into the community. Um, you know, this is a, just, a, just an idea that I've been floating and, and looking at how we can bring, uh, you know, racialized women, um, women from all backgrounds together to celebrate Persons Day in October. And wouldn't it be neat to have some of this data reported to help people understand here's where the barriers and challenges are and there's the gaps, but here's the opportunities, right? So we need to flip it towards where are the opportunities so we can create that action plan to make sure that women, um, you know, and community groups and government have the understanding of the context to be able to build that action plan. Um, the other thing I would love to see is a presentation to the African Nova Scotia Road to Economic uh, Prosperity. If that hasn't already happened, let's get that going. Um, and also uh, service providers, in particular police. You know, when we get the data from police, 
we don't have the context. We just have numbers, right? Here's how many, you know, um, criminalized uh, activities, whether it's assaults or, um, you know, breaking enters and so on and so forth. We have that information. But that doesn't tell the story. It's just numbers. There's, there's no context behind it. So I would love to see our um, police services actually have an opportunity to learn more uh, about the story behind the numbers, um, in particular those communities. And so when I look at, at um, I love this map. This is, this is my new favorite website, Danny. <laughs> so it's, it's great to play with and, uh, and, and understand um, you know, where the communities uh, need help. Uh, to feel safe. And so taking this information and ensuring that it's embedded within the public safety strategy that we are beginning to uh, to put together, um, you know, for this next phase of our public safety strategy, we have to make sure that we're taking this data and fully utilizing it so that we can tell the story and make this a better community overall. So shout out to you. Thank you. And I think... Um, <coughs> I think there's uh, just so many alliances uh, that that we can that we can build moving forward, and lots of other community groups that you know that need to be able to have access to this, so that as they're building their plans and they're building uh, their community, that they feel fully engaged to be empowered uh, to step up and uh, and engage. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair, and. Thank you both for coming today. I don't have to echo much of what my colleagues have said because I, uh, I agree. So um, I'll just go to questions. And we had an opportunity to, to sit down and get a little deeper in, into the, the tool and, and discussion pieces. So I'm, um, I'm good there. So my two questions, one is uh, we talked a little bit about it, but it'd be good to maybe ha talk about it more publicly. So. One was like the scalability of this and, and how other municipalities, cities, counties, whatever it might be, could potentially have access to to this this tool and in in I guess even process. And you know, my hope is that this could be a this could be a revenue generating opportunity for engage, because I think <laughs> I think cities across the country, not not even, or maybe even the world would love to be able to ask these simple but never ask questions it's just like how how is your quality of life uh, so I think it's very important so just wondering if the, the plans and thoughts there and also the with Dow supporting development of the tool which I think is amazing that that it's it's very intuitive so it just tells you the skills that we have here at home um, how do you envision um, the ownership of that aspect um, uh, of the tool is is it 100% engage is it in partnership with Dow because they helped develop the tool um, and also I'll take back Deputy Mayor's comment around FCM that be a I just have to figure out what committee it would go to but I think that's an easy an easy one to do so so I'll, I'll definitely follow up and connect you with some folks through FCM maybe I'll just uh, touch I'm gonna start with the second one Councillor Smith, because there are two spellings to Councillor Smith that could be considered here, and the one with the E L O R is the legal one that I, <laughs> you surprised me with uh, about the ownership of the intellectual property associated with this. So, thanks for that question. It's really an interesting one, and I'll just touch on it as it relates to, and and it does relate to the scalability question. Um, uh, the conversation that we're building out with Dalhousie is continuing to become a more robust one. Um, as recently as in the last uh, week, I've been speaking with the president and with the provost, the VP academic, about what's the deeper, broader relationship that has national implications to what it is that we're doing? And is there a center of excellence, potentially, that Dalhousie could be more embedded with that builds on the strengths that the Canadian Index of Well-Being, they're at a university currently, University of Waterloo, could build on. Not, not sure where those conversations will go, um, but the ownership of the intellectual property question is one that we are, as a board, um, uh, focused on right now, and uh, we believe that uh, 
and, uh, th there's this tension that we have where on the one hand, this is about the greater good. So we don't want to be protective in a way where we're commercializing something that we hold so closely that it doesn't expand to the benefit of the wider population. And at the same time, we don't want it to be abused um, or misunderstood. So we're in the conversation about the degree to which we are able to sort of scale this up and not have it overtaken by parties that really don't understand it and worse, could have um, nefarious kind of intentions behind their being attached to the, um, to the data itself. Um, the scalability, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that you see that as a question and this is something that um, Sarah Napier has been pressing me about at the board level where it said, this is, you know, and, and I described it at the beginning as a four-step. Uh, we, we believe that, we are confident that Nova Scotians know that quality of life is an important organizing principle, step one. We've built the resource, step two. We've built the tools that mine the resource, step three. And the only thing left is really to sort of get a society and its many partners, public, private, academic, and uh, community, to mine that information so that we can be more effective in what it is that we're doing. That's a really simple four-step scale that applies to all governments across Canada. Um, and uh, we think it is applicable, and we've been in conversations, we've been uh, flattered by the attention that we've received from Statistics Canada, Department of Finance federally, a Treasury Board federally, um, Public Health Agency of Canada, um, and what we've said back to them is that the, the greatest relevance is probably at a federal, provincial, territorial level and municipal level, so FCM uh, as well, where we're able to say it's not rocket science, there, there, there are concerns with sort of thinking you just take something and you load it into your system and you think it's all going to be good. There's a lot of, um, there was a lot of difficult work in iterating towards what pieces of this fit that will serve us well. So it's not just a matter of importing a template, plopping it down. But there is something in the nature of the scalability that's quite alive to us as an organization where we think this is usable in any jurisdiction, not just in Canada. And, and that's, we, we've received attention from um, the OECD in Paris, as I mentioned earlier, and others, because when they were inviting jurisdictions, this will sound like a bit of a cape or a badge, when they were looking at North America and wanting to have a global conversation just before the pandemic about well-being, the only jurisdiction that they invited in North America was ours uh, wow. to talk about um, well-being as a, an organizing principle, and we still have their attention uh, as a, a place where we can do this especially well. Wow. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. Uh, incredibly informative. Thanks for the questions, colleagues. It was excellent. So thank you again, Danny and Sarah. We appreciate you coming in. Our pleasure, our pleasure. All right, colleagues, it is now time for a motion to go in camera. Thank you. Seconded by, yes, thank you. All right. We shall.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, Councillor Blackburn, would you like to put the motion on the floor? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I move that the Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee, one, adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential staff report dated May 18th, 2022, and two, direct that the staff report dated May 18th, 2022 be, be maintained as private and confidential, I so move. Excellent, seconded by Councillor Smith. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Okay. We uh, are done. Can we, is that correct? Oh, do I, public, public participation? No? No, we, motion to adjourn. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great uh, summer. And I don't think, do we have a meeting scheduled for July? I don't. We have it is? <laughs> All right. That will, we will wait and see on that one. All right. Have a great Canada Day. Happy Canada Day.